we'll be talking about today is the foundational challenge. So it's both introducing my, my new book and also giving you a kind of a, a view of how I see the thesis methodology and how I see the future of our organization. So some of you have already heard about this book and kind of learned about it. This will be a different take on it. So the question is, why another book? We have so many books on the thesis methodology. This is just a small piece of the of what's going on here, right? I think there's probably three times as many books as you see up here on the screen. I couldn't fit them all up on the screen. Maybe some of you are wondering, why do we need another book on the thesis methodology? Well, you know, the methodology is like a giant pie. And you can slice it any number of ways, right? There's like a thousand different ways to slice it. No matter how you slice it, you're always going to get the same core. And that's why oftentimes in the books, it almost seems repetitive because you get PAI and CAPI and many of the same concepts. Because when you get to the core of it, it has the same core concepts, but you can slice it many different ways. So what we're looking at here is really my slice of the pie. And what was interesting about this book, which I think is different from the other books, is it really has minimum theory and a maximum application. Because everybody always asks us, great theory, very interesting, how do I apply it? Because we're sticking in the why, all the theories, the why. So here, forget about the why, it's all about the how, very much tools you can use, very little code language. It's only 250 pages. It's quite an easy read. It's not very thick. And um, it provides lots of real world examples. And really it discloses trade secrets that are exposed for the first time. So, you know, those of you who've taken integrators training, you've been exposed to these trade secrets. But for people that have not been to our expensive, long training with all of its prerequisites and a month of online prep work and then passing the exams, there's a lot of barriers to get access to these trade secrets. Now it's in a book, which means it's open source. So it's not everything. It, obviously, you can't include everything in integrators training, which is a, you know, month online plus seven days of fire hose in person, it's not all going to fit here. But try to boil it down as much as possible. Focus on the tools that are actually immediately applicable. And that's what is in this book. And it's my take on the DS methodology. So in order to explain this, I'd like to go over the following sort of agenda. First, I'll go over what is the Adesis methodology. What is the foundational challenge? And then we'll look at how does the adhesis methodology approach the foundational challenge? And then once we understand that, because you really can't understand what's in this book until you understand what the foundational challenge is and how adhesis approaches it. Once you understand that, then you can understand what this book is all about. And then I'll talk about what comes next. So that's our agenda for the next hour, or probably less. So what is the adhesis methodology? I mean, it's just so much. It's an approach to management. It's a study of change and its repercussions. It's a new way of understanding organizational health, a series of tools and models like the life cycle, the spreadsheet, the TPS matrix, so many different tools that we have. An operating system for cultural transformation. That's the 11 phases, right? It's really a new management paradigm, a new way of looking at how to manage. It's a profession, it's a language, and there's many other things that we can do an accumulation and come up with 10 more things that it is. And it's been applied, this methodology has been applied to many different applications. It's not just to companies. For example, it's been applied to medicine. They actually teach some parts of adhesis in medical schools in different places in the world. Um, there's also history. You know, people are applying the life cycle to history. Uh, there's political science, psychology, coaching, engineering, sports even. We even had a college level basketball coach that was a big fan of Adesis. Um, we did a, a Sindag for a soccer team in Mexico a long time ago. Um, you know, if you go back in the files at the Adesis Institute, there's a bunch of files of different students writing papers on the methodology. And I remember one that kind of sticks out to me was one guy wrote a paper about how to use Adesis to win at poker. So many different applications across the board. So but the core application is organizational transformations. That's what's paying the bills. That's what we've been focused on the most. That's what the Deez Institute, I believe, is mostly focused on. So let's talk about what is organizational transformation. So really it has two things. There's the one is the function, 
which is what it does. Other one is what it looks like. So I'll give you two different definitions. The first definition, what does organizational transformation do? Well, it is a process for creating an organizational culture climate that is able to proactively and constructively identify and address problems and opportunities without external intervention. That's what we're, our goal is. That's what the goal of organizational transformation is. Creating an organization that's able to solve its biggest problem, which is its inability to solve its own problems. So again, this is how we're different from traditional consultants. A traditional consultant is an expert in a certain field, in a certain industry, this is traditional, and they can solve any number of problems within that specific field or industry. Many problems, they're experts in one industry. In Adesis, we're different in that we work with all industries and we only solve one problem. We're not experts in a certain field. What is that problem that we're trying to solve? Well, I would say it's the biggest problem, which is the organization's inability to solve its own problems. That's your root cause problem. You want to go back, why, 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 why? The reason you have problems is because you're unable to solve your own problems. So what does it look like? Well, that's where the culture of mutual trust and respect comes in. So it's not mutual trust and respect because it sounds good. It's not because it's in the Bible that we should have trust and respect. It's not because we have a value system that we want to live up to, which is all nice. The reason why this is important to have a culture is because if you have this culture, you'll be able to solve your own problems without external intervention. If you don't have this culture, you'll get stuck and you won't be able to solve your own problems. For those of you who have know the, the map, this is really the top of the map, which is saying that they're, you know, it's a management methodology. Why do we need to manage? We all know we need to manage because there's change. If there was no change, if every day was the same, you wouldn't have to make decisions. You could just do the same thing every day. But because there is change, it creates problems and opportunities that we have to manage. In management, what we're doing is, is we are creating change or adapting our organization to better reflect the changing environment in which it operates. That is the process of management. And what we find is that there's a X sometimes in this process. And what happens when you have an X which stops us from adapting to change? Well, a problem unaddressed is a crisis in waiting. And how many crises do we see today in our world? So many crises. Why? because the rate of change is accelerating and the current management paradigm that we are using is not good enough, fast enough, proactive enough to traverse this loop in order to address and adapt our organizations to the changing environment, rapidly changing environment. We're really spinning. We're not able to keep up with this change. That's why we need this new management paradigm. And the new management paradigm again is how do we create this culture so that we are able to solve our own problems and traverse this loop. Think of mutual trust and respect as the muscle we must use, the muscles we use to lift the weight, which is conflict, in order to solve problems and traverse this loop. By the way, why is that we have so many crises? It's not just because the rate of change is accelerating. That's one thing. Sure, it's accelerating. Everywhere in the world, everybody says the rate of change is accelerating. And that's causing more problems and opportunities than ever before. But that's not the only thing happening in this loop right here. The other thing happening is called globalization. hundred years ago, I'm an entrepreneur. I owned my supply chain. I owned my manufacturing. I owned my distribution. And if there was a problem, I could just tell people what to do. I could create change very easily. It wasn't very complex because I'm the boss. Today, if you have a problem in your system, are you able to solve it as easily? No. Why not? Because the people who do the manufacturing or the, dis the supply chain, you probably don't own it. It's probably outsourced. Your manufacturing, also outsourced, probably in China. Your distribution, outsourced. We don't actually own all of the, all the things we need to get the job done. <clears throat> We're partnering with them, which means we can't tell them what to do the same way we could 100 years ago when they were reporting directly to us as the boss. So our ability to affect change is greatly reduced because these people whose cooperation we need either A, don't work for us, and if they do work for us, 
Well, there's monster.com, which is a way of finding a new job if you ever make them mad, right? They can look for a new job like this. They're very much, you know, socially mobile. They can change jobs within no time at all. Their loyalty is gone. They're not going to stick around and let you tell them what to do. If they don't like it, they can move on, which is different from a hundred years ago where people did not have that capability. So that's what the Deezus methodology is really about. Again, solving an organization's biggest problem, which is its inability to solve its own problems. And that's what the foundational challenge is. The foundational challenge is, it's the root cause problem. It's the biggest problem, just like I already said, it's the organization's inability to solve its own problems rapidly enough. So this is sort of from the book. Have you ever felt the pain of not being able to solve a problem, not due to lack of solution, but because of conflict and disagreement between the people whose cooperation you need to implement. <laughs> That's the problem we're trying to solve. And this book is for you. Just on a side note, I was watching, you know, I watched all these news channels and all these politics TV shows. And all the time, there's always have a guest who has some kind of, you know, vision, solution, and they present their solution and they get an applause line. Everybody applauses. And then the interviewer asked them, okay, how do we make it happen? How do we do it? Because there's all these people that, I don't know. I don't know how to make it implemented. That's above my pay grade. That's you hear all the time. Everybody has a solution. The problem is not that we don't have the solution. The problem is, is that everybody has a different solution. And that's what stops us from implementing change. So please take a seat. Yeah. So that is the fundamental challenge. And this book is dedicated to showing people that it's not above your pay grade, right? It's as easy as reading 250 pages, and then we can show you at least the theory as to how to align people around a common solution, how to solve that biggest problem. Again, you don't come in with a solution. That's something else. You come in with a process to put all their solution, align them, the key people whose cooperation you need around a common solution so they will implement in good faith. So now that we understand what the foundational challenge is, it's the organization's inability to solve its own problems, because, not because of lack of solution, but because everybody in the room has a different solution. And we have trouble aligning around a common solution. And the way we overcome this is by building a culture of mutual trust and respect. How is this approach different from other approaches? There's many approaches to solving the foundational challenge. I'm going to differentiate between the front door and the back door. The front door to organizational transformation, to cultural change, looks like this. It's coaching. One-on-one, -on -one, psychological approach. Let's change people's behavior. Or it could be through the use of mission and vision and value statements. And that's kind of preaching how you should act. Different from coaching but also trying to go through the front door and saying, this is the culture we want. Another way that you see a lot is the party approach. Let's take everybody to Ibiza, get them drunk. They all hang out together. End of the day, everybody's best friends because they party together, right? Which many companies do. What's the problem with all of these? Well, it's that we're taking people. Well, first of all, people and their behavior is a product of the environment. People and their behavior is a product of the environment. And it's actually easier to change a person's environment in which they operate, change the system in which they operate, and watch them change their behavior as a result than it is to try and change people and expect them to change their environment. So if you're in an organization with low mutual trust and respect, and you try and coach somebody to start having more trust and respect, to communicate better, to listen better, to be nicer. Is that going to work? It has a very low shelf life because of everybody else in the organization or if the system in the organization is causing people to act in a different way, you can coach all you want. You can lecture about vision and values all you want. You can party all you want. But when they come back to the office on Monday morning, to the old environment, this is a different environment. This is Ibiza. When you come back to the office, what happens? 
they go back to their old behavior. So what is the back door? That's the front door. And the front door is, it works, but there are limitations. In order to explain the back door, let me, I want to give you a different approach. So this is not the back door, but a different approach to changing culture, building teamwork, building a culture of mutual trust and respect. And this is called the ropes course. Those of you who don't know, there's a big industry of taking management teams to the mountains or outdoors and giving them these known as a ropes course. And these are obstacles that no individual can overcome on their own. This lady is going to need the help of this lady in order to do what they have to do, overcome that obstacle. Same thing with this. You can't climb that wall on your own, but by working together, they can climb the wall. There's many different obstacle obstacles they go through, and by working together to overcome these obstacles that no individual can overcome on their own, at the end of the day, teamwork is developed. Everybody is happy, everybody is singing, holding, hugging, the love is in the air. What's the problem with this approach? Again, people's behavior is a product of the environment in which they operate. And it's, we took you out of your office environment to a new environment, the mountains, nature, and your behavior changed. What happens Monday morning when they come back to the office? The, same. the behavior quickly reverts back to the old behavior. But the theory here is sound. What is the theory? The theory is, is that best way to develop teamwork is by getting different people to work together to overcome a challenge that none of them could overcome on their own. That works. I support that. The only thing I don't support is taking them out of the work environment. And that's the question is, why do I have to take you out of the office, out of the work environment to find you an obstacle that no individual can overcome on their own when we have plenty of them in the company? What are those obstacles called? Problems, potential improvement points, opportunities, right? These are issues that no individual can overcome on their own. If they did, if they could solve them on their own, they would have already solved them or they would have been assigned to solve them individually. But there are many issues that are cross-functional. We have a silos. People are not talking to each other. That's how these problems come up. By getting them to work together like this to solve those problems, we can use that as a tool for building mutual trust and respect. And it has additional benefits because when you solve problems, what happens in your environment? For a change, we can make a change, right? The bottom line starts changing because we're solving our problems. We're improving our product. You know, we're improving our supply chain, whatever it is in our delivery times. So that will affect the bottom line. So how do we do it? through collaborative problem solving. So that's what it looks like. This book is about teaching people to be the integrator, which is this person right here. This is not the boss. In traditional meetings, the boss runs the meeting. But when you're dealing with complex problems, the boss doesn't have the bandwidth to both run the meeting, run the agenda, and also understand and listen what's going on. It's too much to hold in one head. Additionally, if you're the boss, in most organizations and you get up and you run the meeting, just the fact of your presence in the front of the room doing most of the talking is going to do what to everybody else in the room? They're going to shut up. They're going to close up. They're not going to think openly. They're not going to take leadership because you're taking all the leadership. So what teaching people to do is someone who is not involved directly with the problem at hand that doesn't have any authority over the problem you're trying to solve but they stand in the front of the room and they take you through a process. And that's what this book is teaching people how to do. How do you, how do you fulfill this role of supporting bosses in their meetings for complex problem solving collaboratively? So that way the boss can sit back, listen and make the best decision possible because you're helping them get all the information they need in order to make the best decision, both information on the subject being discussed and also information on the level of buy-in of all the people whose cooperation they will need to solve that problem. So that's what the book is teaching people how to do.
So again, how to integrate. I just explained what integrate means. Integrate is that job to be that person that's supporting the boss through running the meetings. And if this is done correctly, it helps the organization find better solutions that are implemented quickly and in good faith, which improves the bottom line. Why are they quickly implemented? Because you got the buy-in, or maybe not the full buy-in, but at least you got the opinion and everybody was able to speak up and say why they disagree. In our experience, if you're given a chance to speak up and go on record why you think differently, and the boss has a chance to explain to you why they want to go in a different direction, you might not be happy with it, but you'll accept it and you'll implement in good faith. That's what we're trying to create here. It also builds a culture of mutual trust and respect. That's one of the goals, like we said, overcoming this problem by working together. We can build that culture. It also provides on the spot management, training and development because it's actually as needed when you're actually dealing with the issue, we're learning from each other. And obviously it enriches management styles, of everybody involved because they're being asked to do something that is problem solving. So you might be a lower level worker that's not typically involved with management now you're being asked to get involved with management to help make decisions. That definitely enriches somebody's style. So those are the goals of what we're trying to accomplish through the process described in this book. A little bit about what you will expect to learn in this book. There's two core analogies that sort of outline this book. And those core analogies are holding the line and dancing. I'll explain them very quickly. I know most of you have already heard this before. So in the military, it's very important that we hold the line. As we advance on the enemy, it's important that people don't jump ahead or fall behind. That's why you'll hear in many military movies, hold the line. What happens in the military if somebody jumps ahead? When we open fire, we shoot them. If somebody falls behind, when they open fire, they shoot us. That's what happens in many meetings. Different people advance at different speeds towards the enemy, towards the solution. And if somebody's already found the solution, while somebody else is still trying to understand what the problem is, we end up shooting each other. So your job as an integrator, what we're teaching you to do in this book is how to hold that line. We have to understand, to hold the line, you have to understand what is the terrain we have to cover. That's what's covered in this book. Now, while you're holding that line, right, there's an actual process that's very clearly defined. We have to realize that sometimes you have to jump around in that process. Sometimes the line, you think you're here, but you're actually up there. And now we have to advance very quickly. Or, oh, we made a mistake, we should be back there. How do you know where you should be? Because you have to actually feel the group. You have to feel where they are in the process. To feel the group, you have to listen to the music. What is the music? So again, the dance, sorry, the holding the line, the dance moves, which is holding the line, is actually making sure, the technique of making sure that we cross this terrain. But the music is the conflict. As you're running this meeting, as you're holding the line, you will hear the conflict come up. We have to be in tune to the conflict. We have, in the book, we describe seven different types of conflict and how to make them constructive. And as you're working through that conflict, you might realize that we can advance much faster because there's no conflict or too much conflict. We actually have to go back. We have to listen to that music, the conflict. And the analogy here that goes back to when I was younger, I was invited to go to a dance class. My friend's a dance instructor. He says, come to my dance class. You'll meet a lot of cool people. Great. The first hour teaching you how to dance, it's like this, one foot forward, one foot back. One foot forward, very mechanistic, right? Then, this is salsa, by the way, if you're wondering. <laughs> then they turn on the music, come the professional dancers, and are the professional dancers doing this? You can't find that activity anywhere in what they're doing. Why? Because they're adapting the dance moves to the music they're hearing. That's why if you go see Dr. Adesis run a meeting and integrate, you'll be very hard to follow what he's doing as far as this line goes. Why? Because he's listening to the music and he's dancing. And that's what makes one integrator better than another. How good can you listen to the music? How attuned are you to the music? 
And that's what this core analogies that we go over in this book. We're going to teach you how to hold the line, the dance moves, how to listen to the music, so you can be, so you can start dancing through decisions. That's the goal. This book has lots of real world examples, like food sales over organic liquid fertilizer, which is a real, real world example that Fernando did for his certification. We also have loss of market share, poor quality product. Those are just some like deep examples we go into through this process, through this book, to sort of make it come alive. All of them are business oriented. I did have some political examples here, but I was coached to get rid of them because <laughs> they were too con controversial. So we have loss of market share. This is a diagnosis of why we have loss of market share. This is explaining the spreadsheet for those of you who know that. So this is sort of the, one of the first steps in our process is problem diagnosis. So just give you what we have and then also have one on low quality product. And like I said, we already have one also on uh, poor sales of liquid fertilizer, which is the real, I guess the, it's sort of like a vignette or a, the first, I think it's 20 pages, tell the story of really Fernando's certification that he presented to us, kind of made up a story based on it. And um, then we go back and kind of analyze what Fernando did in this story. And we kind of constantly go back through the book. So that way, the whole idea is to have them sort of watch a center team in action and then explain what was done in every step through the book. So that's how it's designed, how it's organized. So what's the goal? What comes next? Well, the whole thing is, I think the first step is to popularize this book through marketing and hopefully translate the book and publish it in different languages. And then we're going to develop a short course based on the book. In the short term, I'll probably be the one to teach it. But in the longer term, hey, it's a book. As far as, I'm, as far as I know, I might be wrong, but I think anybody can teach a course based on a book. It's become open source, right? So ideally, in the longer term, we'll... we'll try and approach different organizations. I'll probably be giving Fernando a call. Francisco a call. Why did I say Fernando? I'm oh, sorry. Francisco a call and see if we could teach it at tech or somewhere. And then I know we're currently doing that. That's what Matt and Clarice are working on is getting different universities to teach the Adesis methodology in the universities. I think what I'm trying to do here, and I think that's the direction the Institute is going, is to try and make ourselves much more market focused much more, um, less theory, more application. Um, in the past, this has been called derogatory, you know, in a negative way, it's been called fast food because all of our current stuff is very deep, deep into theory because this book doesn't go into why. And when you get in trouble running a center team, integrating a team, and you get in trouble, the answer, the solution is in the why. If you don't understand the why, it's easy to get stuck. But we all know that you want to match the complexity of your solution with the complexity of the organization, right? Just let me explain to you what I mean here. If you work in an organization with five people and you come in with a very elaborate Adesis methodology, you know, uh, administrator, integrator, implementer, resources, full lecture, and then go through all the rules and have our whole deep process, the process is too complex for such a simple organization. They're going to get frustrated. They're not going to want that. They need a much simpler process. We have to dumb down our process for to match the match the complexity of our solution with the complexity of their organization. Now, the same thing is true if you have a very complex organization and you're using a very simple process. It's not going to work either. As the organization evolves, so should the managerial process. So you can think of this book as sort of a beginner's guide. Before the organization gets too complex, there's too much internal fighting, and there's too much going on, if you are working with organizations with enough mutual trust and respect on problems that are not too complex, this will be enough. And the idea here is that in the long run, it'll be a feeder for our deeper course, which is leading highly effective teams at these integrators training. So this will remain our exclusive training of the Adesis Institute. But this eventually will hopefully be, it's open source now, but hopefully later we can get people to start teaching it. So 
At first, it'll probably be associates. You know, as hopefully, if I can convince you guys in different languages. And then uh, maybe later, it'll be people not associates, so we can convince them, sort of train the trainers. And that way, we can expand it and hopefully raise an army of integrators. That's kind of the goal. And I just want to, you know, one of the goals is to compete with Scrum. So I know many of you know about Scrum. They have trainings all over the world all the time. It's also open source. Many different organizations do trainings on Scrum. Okay. We want to go after their market. It's going to be a short training. We're looking at two or three days. No prerequisites, no exams. They probably should read the book before they come, but it's not required. And no certification, right? Just a starting point. Maybe a certificate of attendance, but nothing more. So that's my kind of vision for, but not mine. I think it's, uh, you know, Dr. Jesus was the one who asked me to write this book. So I didn't, you know, I was against it at first because I was like, I don't know how to write a book about integration without the theory. <laughs> so it took me a long time. It took me literally since 2021. So it's been three years that I've been writing this book. I mean, let's face it. This book is a commercial for integrators training. Everywhere in this book, there's always a reference to come to integrators training, come take the course. And so we're definitely letting them know this isn't everything. It's a commercial. And then the course itself, the one I'm describing here, will also be kind of a commercial saying, here are the tools. You want to know more. This is where it'll work. It'll work in simple organizations with simple problems, not too much conflict, high mutual trust and respect. This will work for that. And by the way, that's a lot of cases. If you if this is not working for you, if you pull a muscle, if things start getting uncomfortable in the room and you don't know what to do, now you know who to call. Because I think that they don't even know who to call right now because this information, we've been keeping it so secret, people don't even know it's available in the marketplace. So it's a starting point. But it's definitely just a commercial for okay. deeper. And, and, and a commercial that adds value. It's not just a commercial, it actually has content and real tools. Um, some of the tools we are teaching is stuff like the spreadsheet, but not the spreadsheet. It's just very simple. Causes, people, process, structure, mission, vision, subsystems, operational issues, and manifestations. So we kind of really reduce the complexity of our tools to make them as simple as possible. I, I think you saw that over here with the... Uh, yeah, we'll chart. Yeah, this right here. It's just, there's no, this is this spreadsheet that we're teaching. And one of the key things we're also teaching, which I think is where most people mess up, is what is, I've, I've got my diagnosis, right? Now we understand by working together, we got all the problems on the table, we sequence them. Now, what do we do about it? Now we're in task definition, right? We have to define the tasks. The mistake, the, one of the biggest mistakes that I see new integrators make is they don't know in which sequence we should address the tasks. Where do I start? Should I start asking what is the task or lack, lack of market share? If I do that, I'm going to get lost. Yeah. Should I start here with people do not care about quality? I start there, lose all momentum, people get frustrated, and you're going to lose the room. So understanding the right sequence and just asking, what do we do about this pip? What do we do about this pip? What is the task for this pip? That's one of the key key real world applications that I, that I think will have the most impact. Criteria selection, it's like a two pages. <laughs> Solution finding is a paragraph. So I don't go deep into those guys. But I think I give enough tools. I think so. We'll have to see. I have to test it. You know what I mean? But um, I'm pretty proud of it. I think it's a good book. I reread it when I was going through this book to you know check all the spelling and all the formatting. And as I was reading it, I get times where I'm like, Nobody's ever going to read this. And then other times I'm saying, you know what? It's pretty good. And then I had a call with, um, it's a specific type of a consulting company that helps implement a software system for, um, for programmers, program development. And it's a pretty big organization. And I had a call with them because they're considering attending integrators training. And as I'm talking to the guy, he says, yeah, I'm a big fan. I read all of the books of Adesis and I also read your book. <laughs> And Tamara just sent out the email like probably less than a week before I talked to this guy. So the guy downloaded the ebook and already read it. So I was, I was, I was like, you're the first one. Other than my mom, <laughs> and, you know, and a few associates, you're the first one. So it is, you no, know, I think he, he gave me positive feedback. I don't know how to take it. Um, 
if you know, because oftentimes they'll just tell you nice things just because you're on the phone with them. Okay. So just one more thing here I want to say is just that this is the dedication. So the book is dedicated to past, present, and future Adesis Associates worldwide who have and continue to make overcoming the foundational challenge their life's mission. So this is really a book for us and for other people that we try, we try to raise this army of integrators. Okay?